their text, you know, so they're kind of recognising that they're artificial stories. Um, and from a technical perspective, you know, science fiction used to be that sort of thing, and that's still the kind of the default mode for science fiction, is to say, I'm going to tell a story as, as simply as possible to try and get the reader to be embedded in that story because the concepts themselves are so alien. Um, whereas for me, I can't really do that unless I point out that actually this is the whole thing is just a construct. You know, and I actually got to the point where I'm kind of wondering why I'm doing this. Like why, why am I doing this? For, you know, with a man like Dreaming, the fun part is having a hard-boiled Adolf Hitler getting beat up in London. But if you just wrote that, that would be morally reprehensible. That would just be, you know, an exercise in... I don't know. but so, so you need that meta layer, you need that extra layer that kind of says this is fiction and kind of bringing in the real world to act as a, as a balance to it. But I think what I enjoy is probably writing just the pulpy stuff. Yeah, which, is, which, which leads us to my next question, because um, uh, you like pulp, you draw loads of um, uh, inspiration from it. And uh, what do you think is the source of your proclivity to play with pop fiction? Uh, what is uh, so stimulating about th- that lowbrow kind of literature that, you know, um, uh, you find uh, a kind of, you know, uh, uh, your source material, something you want, to, you want to work with? Well, I mean, I don't think it's pulp. I mean, I like the covers for pulp, you know. I like the, the visual element of pulp. But I think when we talk about pulp, because science fiction has been defined as pulp, and of course crime fiction has been, romance has been defined as pulp, is the fact that it's based on story. It's based on, it has a plot, you know, it has a formula. And the nice thing about formula is once you have a formula, you know how the formula is supposed to play out. And I find it extremely useful, you know, because I can't, I'm not really good at plots. Like, I don't understand plots. And plots are really important in genre fiction because, you know, you want to feel your heroes are striving towards something and then they get there in the end. I don't really care. So I like to have a detective looking for something because they're like, ah, well, you know, at least someone has a reason to go and do something. Otherwise, I think my heroes would generally just stay home and not do anything. So <laughs> it's, um, but it doesn't make any, any difference to it because I don't really care about it. And um, the, the classic example of when that kind of came back to bite me was uh, a book that hasn't come out yet. But again, I wanted to use the detective formula because that was a really easy formula to use. And so I have my guy looking for his missing niece, I think it was. And uh, that kind of propels the plot along, and it goes off, and it's this very strange parallel universes, political pulp noir thing. And uh, I had to write a, a whole synopsis for this book and send it to my editor at the time. And, um, and she came back and she said, that's, that's really interesting, but what happens to the girl he was looking for? And I said, oh, oh yeah, he was looking for this girl, wasn't he? <laughs> um, and I completely forgot. And obviously you have to play you have to play by the rules, so I had to figure out what happened to her and kind of write it, because otherwise people aren't gonna be very happy about it. But you know, with a man like dreaming, for example, that was it had that plot driven thing, but I couldn't care any less about resolving the mysteries and that was one of the things that came into edits is that people kind of say you have to make it a bit more of a mystery. Um, but for me, it's just tools. It's all tools. It's, it's Whether it's crime or science fiction, if you know where the story is going, that's where I can go and have fun with it and take it somewhere else. That's why I argue that um, uh, you're more the postmodern writer than a science fiction writer for one particular reason, you know. Um, uh, one of the definition of postmodernism is, you know, that uh, successful combining of highbrow and lowbrow literature. And you can do that. You can do that quite easily and you can do that quite successfully, you know. Your writing draws inspiration from, uh, from pulp fiction, from pulp cliches, you know, from pulp formulas, but on the other hand, it's very literary. So uh, I guess it's your conscious choice, right, to, to you. And they're not always a metaphor for the human condition. I mean, we do actually have spaceships. Um, <laughs> and, and, you know, it is, I mean, I think with Central Station, which is my one science fiction book, I made a big mistake, because I just wanted to play with all the cliches of science fiction and you know I wanted to have the robots and the dome cities and the thing and I didn't realise people I didn't think anyone would read it if I'm, if I'm being honest and then it got picked up by all these guys in Silicon Valley because they love this stuff you know they love 
happy future. They love the future where we didn't destroy ourselves with self-driving cars and 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 climate change. Um, and then like this is like a blueprint for how we can really have a great future where we have robots and. Co- I was like, no, this is just yes, exactly. this isn't how it's gonna work out. We're gonna die like a hundred years. Um, this was just me having fun with golden age tropes. So I, I kind of thought at that point, I was like, oh, I made a terrible mistake. I have to start writing books about how we're all going to die in 100 years. Um, which is a bit optimistic, to be honest. Um, so I still feel really guilty for that. So science fiction is one thing, but on the other hand, I have an impression that Jewish themes seem to play a significant role in your writing. Um, uh, and in a manner of speaking, uh, your writing is sort of suspended between Jewish themes and uh, your cosmopolitan perspective, you know present in, uh, in uh, Central Station particularly. Mm. Uh, Men Lies Dreaming and to a certain degree Martian Sands are your artistic attempts to deal with the Holocaust, while Central Station is a work of fascinating multicultural and cosmopolitan scope. So h- how do those two spheres find their way uh, in, your, in your writing, find their way out in, 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 in your prose? Yeah, well, I mean, I don't think I'm a particularly Jewish writer. It's to just, a degree you are. Yeah, no, I know. <laughs> um, I just don't think of myself that way. And I think uh, up until recently, no one else did either. It just suddenly I got discovered by, you know, the Jewish magazines and so on. Um, but it's not necessarily the way I think of it, but it's just, you know, I got to the point, I think I was living in Southeast Asia. I was living, because I spent like a year living in the South Pacific on a desert island, basically. And, and then a couple of years living in Laos in Southeast Asia. And I was writing these stories that were kind of like science fiction, that were kind of fairly decent, that were set in Thailand or Laos or Vanuatu or whatever. You know, and I, I saw them and they showed up in years best anthologies and so And they weren't very honest, that was the problem. I was kind of writing, I could make it work just about, but it wasn't very honest, you know. And I got to the point where I thought I should be writing about what I know. You know, where I grew up. What, and so Central Station comes from that. Central Station um, is, on, is an honest book because I'm not pretending, I'm not laying claim to anyone else's culture or, or background. You know, I'm writing about the places I know, the people I know. Um, and that's what was important to me. It was kind of like making the distinction, you know, between I can write something that is decent enough to get paid for, whether I can write something that is honest. Um, so I was never very happy with that, the sort of stuff I wrote. So uh, to what extent that uh, all the travelling of yours, and you extensively travelled in, uh, in Asia, South Pacific, um, uh, Europe and, and Africa, informs your writing? And uh, not just travelling, but also different cultures, traditions, and particularly languages, because uh, your native language is Hebrew. Uh, you speak uh, South Pacific Pidgin English, but um, uh, you write in literary English. Uh, to what extent all these things inform your writing? Well, a lot. I mean, um, you know, Bishlama, which is the, the South Pacific pigeon I see, um, is a huge influence in Central Station. And I think the one mistake I made was because I got so used to incorporating it as asteroid pigeons. So the whole idea was that basically the people who are going to go work in the asteroids uh, would be, you know, poor Pacific Islanders, so people from Borneo, or people from Vanuatu, or the Solomon Islands. And they end up using the same contact language that people have always used, which is kind of Pidgin English, which is one of the simpler languages to, to communicate in. Um, and the mistake I made was not saying anywhere that this was... I kind of say it in the book, but I never put a disclaimer, this is a real language. So people go, where did he... You know, he kind of invented this whole language. That's quite impressive. I'm like, I did not invent this language. It's a real language. Um, I just had to speak it for, you know exclusively for a year. But funnily enough, one of the people who really pushed uh, Bishalama as a, as a universal language is a guy called Ken Campbell, who was a big science fiction fan back in the 70s, and uh, sort of a, a weird theatre director, and he did the Illuminati trilogy. He did the Illuminati on stage, I think, which was like a 12-hour production. Um, and he did Macbeth in Pigeon. And I spoke to his daughter, because he died, he died a few years ago, and I spoke to his daughter recently. And she said, they basically had no idea how the language even sounds, but they just kind of, you know, they looked at some references and they translated Macbeth into, uh, <laughs> into their version of what the Shama might sound like and put it on stage. And um, so I kind of, in a way, took his concept, you know, 
and, and brought it forward. But it's had a huge influence, and I think it's a problem when people expect you to write standard English, and it's like, I don't want to write standard English, I want to write my version of English. So you um, mean something like Joseph Conrad syndrome? I'm going to show you guys what English well, is. Well, Conrad, I think, was writing very formal in a way, wasn't he? Or not? I don't know, but I mean, for me, it's like in, it's trying to incorporate, you know, Hebrew patterns and Bishlam patterns, and and also literary style. So stuff like run-on sentences or not always using quotation marks, and and people frown on it. You know, when the violent century came out, which all he does is doesn't use quotation marks. It's like God forbid, you know. <laughs> there are so many novels that don't use. It's, it's like such a basic thing in in fiction, not to use quotation marks, but not in genre. So people who pick this up, and I mean, one review kind of said, you know, I picked this up expecting this to be Watchmen in book form, and it wasn't book <laughs> Watchmen in book form. And you can't argue with the guy because clearly you did, you know, it's it's your fault because he wanted Watchmen and he didn't write Watchmen. He, he read your own book. Um, but they were like, I don't understand why there's no quotation marks. And he's like, try reading more widely. You know, you might. And you you use semicolon, which I like a lot. And I use semicolon. Yeah, I have a, a bit. Cormac, Mac- Cormac McCarthy is known for you know hating semicolon. You know, he hates all punctuation. It. He hates all punctuation. Um, anyway, uh, tonight I'd like to concentrate on Central Station for two particular reasons. It's one of the most unusual science fiction novels in recent years, and it was nominated for the Clark Award. Uh, almost won it. Um, <laughs> almost won it. <laughs> <laughs> almost won it. Yeah. Oh, could, could I request no spoilers, please? So yeah, no, 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 no worries. No, no spoilers, There's, there's actually no way of spoiling it. <laughs> there's no plot. <laughs> <laughs> Although, to, to you just you spoiled, spoiled it. it. <laughs> Nothing happens. <laughs> to say something about spoilers, I think it was William Gibson who tweeted that if a book, uh, if your reading pleasure is spoiled by spoilers, it means the book is not very good, really. Well, Raymond so, Chandler had the argument that a book should be the sort of book that if you tear out the last eight pages of the book, it still it was still worthwhile. And I have to say, I, that I, actually I, happened to me. Then and it, it's incredibly frustrating when you're stuck on an on you know on a transatlantic flight, and you've been ex- really excited about this book, and you're reading through, and you leave to the end just to see, you know, and then you realise the end is missing, and you're halfway <laughs> to Thailand on your way to the South Pacific, and that's the one book you have because they didn't have Kindles back then. It's very frustrating. And actually, didn't we email the author at some point years later, China, and he was like, "What do you want from me?" Yeah, the, the, the Chinatown Death Cloud Terror, which is about pulp writers. Um, yeah, and, and we, I ended up email, emailing the author and saying, you know, that was really, really not on. He said, what's what you want from me? You know? But yeah, that sucked. So anyway, so, well, we're, yeah, we're, 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 I would like to concentrate on, on, on Central Station tonight. Obviously, we'll have question time, and if you'd like to ask Lavi about any of his other novels, you know, um, uh, we'll definitely have time for that. Um, uh, I'll show this, this, is this wonderful edition of Central Station That's by really from nice. PS Publishing, and uh, uh, I would like to discuss this particular edition in a moment. But first, a few questions uh, connected with, uh, with the novel. Uh, storytelling is one of the foundations of, of Central Station. Uh, where does the awareness of storytelling as the fundamental human need and activity come from? Because in, in my case, for example, uh, my, my choice of literature as a career was sort of programmed because my parents read a lot to me. I, I got loads of books as a kid. When I was still a university teacher, uh, I told my students that I don't remember my first toy, I remember my first book. Which is true. Yeah. Uh, how did it work in your case? Um, uh, why storytelling? Uh, no spoilers, but it's far distant future. Each character in the book has a story. The story refers to the past, which is that's our future. Spoiler, mm-hmm. really and that's spoil. that's one of those yeah. really interesting, uh, fascinating aspects of the book. Um, uh, so how did it work in your, in your case, that the awareness that storytelling is such a fundamental human, uh, human activity and need? Well, no, I mean, in, specifically with Central Station, actually the whole wider universe, which kind of exists in short stories, is the influence of Cordwain Smith, um, who was this obs- 
who is now very obscure, but was this American science fiction writer back in the 60s. Uh, and it was a CIA. Uh, was, it, wasn't, it wasn't in the CIA, but he was like an expert on uh, uh, psychological, psychological warfare. warfare yeah. And uh, he was very influenced by Chinese storytelling in turn. Um, so it's, it's, and it's, a, it's a handy shortcut for creating future histories because basically you're kind of telling the story from a position that's even further in the future where all this stuff already happened. So you're kind of going, oh, you know, it was the, the, the you kind of throw away a mention of the robot rebellion of 2350 and everyone knows what you're talking about because that happened years ago. So it's kind of a nice technique to use. Um... But, you know, that was kind of the sense. What Central Station really is, it was kind of because the books have been doing, the novels are so narrative-driven, because I've been using that detective thing to move things along. I want to do the absolute opposite thing. I wanted to write something that didn't have a plot and such, didn't have that kind of moving motivation. And, you know, it annoyed a lot of people, really. You know, and people don't... They kind of go, oh, this book doesn't have a plot. Um, it's like, yes, I know. Um, that's really annoying. Um, well, Arabian Nights don't have a plot, right? right. And but, it works. But it's a different sort of project. I mean, if you look at... And it, in a way, this is, this is very much homage to classic science fiction. So it's homage to City, Lord of Light. I mean, this is how science fiction used to be written. The reason for that is because you could sell the book twice. You could sell the short stories to a magazine and then you could sell the book so you could make a little bit more money um, so that's what I that's what I did um, well that was my plan anyway it, didn't, it wasn't really a very good plan but, but it, because that model doesn't really exist anymore and also because the western science fiction model is so dependent on plot and action particularly on, um, action, yeah. particularly on action I wanted to move I wanted to do the exact opposite but at the same time I expected 200 people to read this book um, so I, clearly I was I was very wrong about that um, but I still don't understand why people seem to like this book mostly because again it doesn't have a plot um, nothing happens I probably wouldn't have bought it and <laughs> I, don't, I don't understand it it's and it's a a clever collection of short stories. It's a fix-up, right? It's something good. they used to it's call a, 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 a fix-up. Um, uh, but was it your way? Uh, no, this is John's fault. He introduced that stupid term. <laughs> and we've all been paying for it ever since. Um, so the <laughs> idea of... A, well, I think, I think you know what you meant by it, but I think people get it the wrong way. It's really frustrating. Basically, people think a fixer is you write a bunch of short stories and then you decide that they magically belong together and maybe you added a little bit in between. Whereas if you look even at City, you know, from 1953 or whatever, it was, it's clearly written as a single work that's told in section. Central Station was not, oh, I'm going to write a short story and then... You know, I'll match another... And this, this has been really frustrating for me in terms of the reviews. Because this is clearly a single work that just has been written over, you know, five, six years in kind of self-contained sections. And the reason I did that, first, is because it allowed me to do it while I was working on other stuff. And secondly, it allowed me to sell them individually and kind of make a tiny bit more money while I was doing it. Um, but because that model is so alien to modern science fiction, which is about big epics mostly, um, people just didn't seem to know, you know, what to do with it, where it came from. And there's this perception that uh, we just read a bunch of short stories and then kind of put them together into a collection. But if you, if you read them individually, even when they came out in Interzone or Analog or whatever, you can see the references to the other stories already in it. Which is a, w a bit weird, what you just said, because uh, when you take a closer look at the, at the novel, what makes it a novel, you know, uh, and, and a coherent novel, to be honest, is the way all the characters are interrelated and uh, uh, right. interact. So there are, you know, those... Uh, each character refers somehow to another character, you know, they, they somehow, you know, are in former partners or, or, or things like that. And I would like to concentrate for a moment on, on characters because yeah. it's, a, it's a very character-driven novel and it's a very place-driven novel, you know, that mm. the central station, the specific place. We'll get back to that in a second. Uh, but I, for a moment, I would like to take, um, take a closer look at, at the characters, particularly one of them, because when we take a look at this book, guys, 
It's a beautiful addition. Yeah, really and uh, mm. I think that the designer of, of that illustration, Sarah Ann Langton, uh, was awarded, right? She, she won an award for, for this particular illustration. And obviously, we would love to have this book in our hands. We would love to read it. We would love to, you know, keep it and, and have it. Uh, one of the characters in Central Station is uh, Achimwin, right? Am I, the, the Achimwene. Achimwene, which yeah. Is, um, it's which is very difficult to pronounce. It's Um Sorry. Uh, yeah, it's, it's, uh, it means brother in Chichewa, which is the language spoken in Malawi. Right. I just, yeah. So Achimweni, uh, a second-hand bookseller, who in this, in his world, is, is a sort of dying breed, uh, someone who cannot get online. There's a future version of the internet called the conversation, and you have to be born to it. You have to have special, you know, uh, genes and talents and you know other things to to to, to get connected, and uh, mm, he cannot do that. He, uh, he can only stick to, to, to physical paper books. And don't you think that to a certain extent we are the dying bridge right now, nowadays? Yeah. Uh, I, I remember we were talking the other day about the book of yours you, you're, you're currently working on, uh, which is set in the early 2000s when uh, the, world was con the, the publishing world was yeah. contemporary, dif t yeah. totally different. And uh, uh, Turing Cross Road was a different place, right? Yeah. Uh, are, are we the dying breed, in, uh, and uh, is it one of the messages in in in, um, in Central Station? Well, it's not the message, but I mean, I grew up with as the internet was growing up because I was one of those geeky BBS kids. I don't, does anyone know what BBS was? Someone must have used that, right? Um, so I kind of felt like I spent my whole life waiting for the internet to arrive, and then for the speeds to get to the point where they are now, you know, and it's tragic when you think, I've literally gone from, I think my first modem was a, my first mo my first real modem was a 300 BPS modem, but it never worked. So my first <laughs> proper one was 2400 BPS modem. So, you know, it takes you about 40 minutes to download a black and white picture in like pixelated. Um, so you're waiting like, oh man, it's like been like, it's been like 25 years and I can download a movie, you know. And obviously kids born today don't have that. And I grew up with the internet industry, so writing about the internet this is something I kind of know about. And it's easy enough to project it further. And I think that's why they may have liked it in Silicon Valley, because they can kind of see where it's going. Hopefully it's not going to be, you know, direct brain implants, but at the same time it probably is going to be direct brain implants. Um, you know... So is our attachment to, to paper books a thing of the past, you think? Well, I think it's going to be probably like vinyl. Um, you know, you're still going to collect it. It's still going to have great value as an object of art. But, you know, you're not just going to buy a book to read in paper. It's just crazy. I mean, um, you're just going to read it on your... I mean, I, you know, now if I want to read a book, I read it on my phone. I don't know. Yeah, I just read it on my phone, basically. Um, I buy a book if it's, you know, if it looks like this, I buy it, because that's amazing. Yeah. Um, uh, the intertext of Central Station is very rich, and uh, there are references to such authors as C.L. Moore, Ray Bradbury, Clifford Simak, Philip Kiddick, of course, Cordwainer Smith, and perhaps half a dozen others. But I think the novel is very new wave in its spirit. Uh, you mm -hmm. present a fascinating far distant future, uh, which is not particularly optimistic. And uh, that's, that's one of the, I would say that's one of the problems. That the, there's poverty, there's uh, inequality, there are other problems, you know. Um, uh, yeah, but... Uh, <laughs> did you have any particular contemporary problems uh, in your mind when you were writing some of the stories? Uh, no, I mean, I didn't... I've seen people say it's dystopian and they don't understand why. I, it's just kind of like, I it's say real dystopian, life. but yeah, it's we'll, get, real we'll get to it's, that. You know, you've got, but um, no, it's very much inspired by a real time and a real place, which is the central station area of, central station, the central bus station area of Tel Aviv, which is um, basically now inhabited by both African refugees coming in from um, Sudan and Eritrea, and by um, migrant economic workers from Thailand and the Philippines and places like that. So it's an absolutely fascinating place. You know, it's incredibly poor. There's still a few kind of old Israelis still living there, you know, kind of holding on 
to what you, and and it always used to be kind of the dodgy part anyway so you had all the junkies and the prostitutes and they're still sort of hanging on but now you have like a quarter of a million refugees and immigrants in so it's a fascinating place and in the middle of that is the actual tel aviv central bus station which is this enormous monstrosity uh, that's like a, a town unto itself with its own nuclear fallout shelter uh, which is amazing. So, I mean, you couldn't, you, you know, when, once you start going there, you kind of think, I have to write about this place. So, really, I'm just kind of projecting a little bit ahead you know, with the addition of a few spaceships. And, you know, I know what I wanted to do was kind of have all the golden age science fiction background I could have. I wanted to have everything in there, all the cool science fiction stuff, and then just ignore it completely <laughs> and just have people kind of get on with the stuff. You know, so. But like I said, I just didn't think anyone would actually care. Um, that's, yeah. that's where I kind of went wrong. So, um, uh, so the equivalent of the internet, but also the matrix from uh, numerous cyberpunk texts in Central Station is the conversation. Mm. Uh, so it almost automatically Might links... Be more technically correct than William Gibson. Yeah. Imagine, but, yeah. Uh, but it almost automatically links you to, to cyberpunk as this specific subgenre of, 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 of science fiction. But you, you never spoke highly of, of uh, cyberpunk. You know? Yeah, but did it have an influence on you? you? Because to, I wouldn't say that to any degree this novel is cyberpunk, but it draws inspiration from cyberpunk, definitely. Well, it draws inspiration from everything. But I mean, cyberpunk was essentially... I mean, Neuromancer is essentially taking Raymond Chandler and doing Raymond Chandler with, you know, computers. That's kind of it. It's, it's hard-boiled, it's noir. And then, if you remember, all through the kind of the 90s and the early 2000s, British writers kind of went, noir is super cool, let's do science fiction noir. You know, Richard Morgan did science fiction noir, Alistair Reynolds did science fiction noir. I mean, they were great books. But, I mean, everyone was doing that in a non cyberpunk way for a bit. Whereas cyberpunk itself was kind of like you had William Gibson on one end, you know, with Neuromancer, and then 10 years later you had Snow Crash. And in the middle there was a lot of people who kind of said, oh, I, you know, maybe I should write a book like William Gibson, I could also make millions of dollars or whatever. That doesn't work. So no, there's nothing cyberpunk in Central Station. Um, it does, it, there's nothing hard-boiled or noir about Central Station, I should say. Um, it's got computers in it, but that's that's just our reality. That's but also low light, fiction. which is which is very much cyberpunk like. Yeah, but cyberpunk was always about how cool it was because they're not really low lights, are they? They're more like I'm a hard code. I'm a cowboy. I'm a code cowboy from the sprawl. You know, they weren't really like I'm just someone who tries to get by. They're always doing something really important, like saving the world from the AI that's going to communicate with the other AI who lives on the other solar system or whatever. Whereas my guys are just kind of like, you know, I just need to pay for school and make sure I've got a meal and I've got kids to raise. And, you know, that's really not cyberpunk, is it? Um, no one in cyber ever thinks, you know, I've got kids to, I've got to take the kids to school before I go off to design asteroids to, to fight the AI. So uh, you, you sort of disagree yeah, yeah. with uh, the interpretation of uh, Central Station as a dystopian novel, and I, I, I wouldn't say it's a particular dystopian novel, uh, not in the you know long tradition of dystopian novels. But on the other hand, and uh, that's not a spoiler, uh, but none of the none of the characters ends up as a particularly happy person. There's not so much happiness, that's you know. That's not true. That's that's a, see. I don't see that. I don't see this dystopian at all. I just see. I'm not saying this dystopian, but you know, not particularly no, but, happy, not particularly but optimistic. Why? It's a, well, it's all about romance. It's a romance novel. That's the way I describe it. It's a romance novel, and most romances sort of work in the end. So it ends with a it ends with a funeral and a wedding. So there's obviously a, a big Richard. A spoiler. Well, not really, yeah, but, it is. But it is a big Richard Curtis influence, basically. <laughs> <laughs> there's like four weddings and there's a funeral. Um, but that's just normal life, this is what I mean. So, you know, and some of the couples are... I did want to do the kind of four weddings and a funeral end at some point. You know, when, when it says what happens to everyone after the credits. Run. But yeah, you just get the sense that they kind of... This is just a moment in these characters' lives and they go on and do other stuff that you just don't know about. 
But I think it mostly works out. It's a, I'm not saying it. It's a happy. Yeah, but so, uh, well, no. other than the funeral. But. <laughs> um, anyway, um, uh, you like working with really big figures. Uh, a man lies dreaming. Main character is Adolf Hitler. Your n- uh, new novel uh, coming out at some point next year uh, from uh, Tacking Press is uh, your take on Philip K. Dick's Ubik, but its main character is uh, L. Ron Hubbard. No, no. I mean, for legal reasons, I must say that L. Ron Hubbard had nothing to do with this book. And, uh, but he's a main character. No, 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 no. There's no L. Ron Hubbard. There's, there's a guy who most likely resembles certain incidents in the life of Aaron Hubbard, but for legal reasons, again, I But could you briefly, have briefly introduce the novel? I don't even know the title. Well, no, because it has it. Well, I've, I do have a novel coming out, hopefully, next year, and it's. Well, Elwin Hubbard, I wish you didn't bring this up. I mean, um, but again, nothing but respect um, for anyone listening. Um, yeah, there are people out there. Yeah, to, to the people who are listening. No, I mean, I love Elwin Hubbard. I mean, I absolutely adore Elwin Hubbard because. He was the guy that everyone wanted to be, basically. You know, he was the pulp. He was the ultimate pulp writer, right? He was the guy who kind of made his life writing pulp fiction, and he was really good at it. And he said, "You know what? I could go that one extra bit." And they all wanted it. You know, Heinlein wanted it. He could never do it. You know, they all wanted. You know, the guy Frank Herbert. You know, they all wanted it. They were all obsessed with the whole idea of messiahs. And this guy actually said, I'm going to be the Messiah. I'm going to start my own religion. And he did. How awesome is that? I would do it. I'm too lazy. <laughs> most, most writers are too lazy, but he could actually carry it off. But the great thing about Aaron Hubbard is after he's done all this, after he's started his own empire, you know, and after he was worth billions of dollars and he has this, um, you know, this, all these ships traveling around the world. For 10 years, he was living on board this yacht, sailing around the world. He kind of goes, you know what? I really like writing science fiction. I don't really like this stuff. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to leave it to someone else to deal with. I'm going to go and live in a trailer somewhere and I'm going to write science fiction. And he did it. And that's what he did. Yeah. You know, he had two typewriters, packets of cigarettes, and he wrote Battle for the Earth. Great film. Um, great masterpiece. And, uh, you know, that ten volume thing that he wrote. The plan. The what? Plan, so. No, it's like the ten, ten volume... It's, it's science fiction. Yeah. Science fiction. Um, and he wrote that and then he died. I mean, and I think that's the greatest thing that anyone can do. He kind of went, I did all this, I've done everything. And actually, I just really like the hanging out. <laughs> um, and that's what he did you know if you read about the early days of science fiction the golden age it was just Heinlein kind of hanging out with Campbell and Asimov and Heinlein um, having barbecues in the backyard but it's, it's kind of that dream it's how how does science fiction become religion you know how does science fiction become this force it comes out of the book and it comes into real life and you know stuff like UFO religions I find fascinating and so, so writing about someone like Elwin Hubbard, and again for legal reasons on my state, but there's no connection to the real Elwin Hubbard whatsoever. Um, you know, how can you not write about that? It's so interesting. And it's, the 20th century is such a science fictional century. Um, and it's really interesting to kind of look at those forces and how fiction and reality kind of intersect over and over. Um... How much time do we have? Okay. Yeah, can, can I get okay, yeah. yeah. Excellent, excellent, thank you. So um, I, there are two more things I would like to just at the end, and then we'll have time for, for, for your questions. Uh, short fiction, because I, I have an impression that short fiction uh, plays an important role in your writing. Yeah. And, and uh, it is generally believed that some writers are natural-born uh, novelists, and some writers are natural-born short story writers. Right. Uh, which one of these are you? And, yeah, um, I'm not a novelist at all. I mean... I don't know how I managed to publish any books at all, to be honest. Um, no, I think for me, I'd probably write say novellas would be the, the, the perfect have... length. No, oh, that's, that's, a, get... that's a proper novel. It's that's short. That's not even say so. Well, a, yeah. No, it's, it's a very short novel, yeah. It's a very short novel. <laughs> <laughs> but, I mean, ideally, the novella would be my perfect length, but obviously that's also what pays the least, and no one wants to publish it, and it's an absolute nightmare, so... 
Um, yeah, but you know, I'd happily, or I used to write a lot of short fiction, now I kind of write less short fiction, but I'm still, I'm really not a long, not a novelist, and writing, especially now, because like in the 60s, you could get away with a penguin paperback for 50, 60,000 words, and now you have, you're expected to deliver 90,000 words, like, I don't know, 90,000 words, like, you could write the history of the human race, and you'd still have, like, 50,000 words left, probably. so I really struggle with it. So, so is this why you once described uh, The Violent Century as your accidental novel, because... Did I? Yeah, you did, you did. Mm. As a kind of, you know, I, writing I, accident. I'll could, take could your word you? for it. But, um... No, that was a difficult one. That is structured as a novel, but again, if you look at it, it's kind of set pieces a bit, isn't it? So it's got a bit of a bit set in the Cold War and a bit set here and a bit set here. It's a proper novel. Well, what I learned is I kind of have to fit my strengths. So if I can write bits and sort of yeah, do some. Join them. I don't know. Um, it's quite, but that's why something like the detective plot is quite nice because that kind of allows you to move along. And I mean, a lot of science fiction and fantasy is really just about exploring the world that you find yourself in, anyway. Um, and I thought that was quite nice. Like you can just, you can, you know, you're a bit of a two. It's a bit like travel writing, basically, <laughs> science fiction. Um, but yeah, I, I do find it a lot easier in short stories, and it also it's so much less work. It's, you just, you know, something happens and it's over and then you move on to something else. But books, you just like... Uh, so just what is your current project? Is it short fiction, novellas or, or, or a novel? No, so I'm working on that stupid, not L1 Hubbard book, um, which is kind of cool. And uh, you've just finished uh, a book for children, right? Could you say... No, no, I can't say anything about okay. that. Uh, yeah. Also, that seems really ironic, doesn't it? Because... You know, imagine these poor kids, they kind of, they say, oh, I, I like this guy, I wonder what else he's written. Oh, Adolf Hitler. Uh, that sounds yeah, interesting. Adolf Hitler novel. So, yes, I wonder what he said about Adolf Hitler. Um, so that's going to be interesting. But, um, yes. But now, hopefully the next kind of big book would be this book about, basically about science fiction's golden age and how it's shaped the 20th century. Um, and it is kind of my response to Ubik, in a way. So I don't know. I'm at the point I'm editing it now, and I hate it. I hate everything about again this a book, very so. postmodern approach, right? Your personal take on on Philip K. Dick's, just like this one is. Um, uh, Martian Sense, uh, right? Uh, yeah, it, it, it's Lavie's take on uh, 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 the three. Um, which one is it? Uh, can't even. Uh. Which is his Martian? Which of his Martian books is it? Martian Times? Yeah. Martian Times, yeah. No. Yeah. No. It's, there's a bit of a simulacre in it, because actually I only like the Philip K. Dick books that no one else likes. So I like the simulacre and I like it's the, really. the game players of Titan. It's, no, it's a terrible book, but it's a great book. You know? I hate you book. I absolutely <laughs> hate you book. It's a terrible book. Um, so that's why you wanted to play with it, you know, your... Well, I've got a, I've got like a throwaway reference to you, like at the end of, you know, the, the Hubbard book. But, uh, yeah, which is something you know I suggested you a different take on it and yeah, no. a different um, ending. So, but yeah, so I mean, Osama in a way is kind of my man I dream. Um, it's my man in the high castle. Yeah, and then what's a man? What's a man like dreaming? I don't know. But not really a, a Philip K. Dick reference. Well, I think they all kind of correspond with different Philip K. Dick books. You know, right? Uh, one more as aspect of Lavi's work I would like to emphasize tonight is his connection with art and artists. Uh, he's written two graphic novels and uh, he's been very successful with uh, writing, uh, working with, with artists. And here are two examples. Uh, Sarah Ann Langton, you know, um, designed this wonderful cover and uh, as I believe was awarded for this. And uh, Pedro Marquez from Portugal, who designed this cover, and uh, Osama original cover. Right. Uh, what's your experience of work working with artists? To, to what extent working with visual artists informs your writing, stimulates you? Well, Pedro is a bit of a, an exception, because I have no input whatsoever into what Pedro does. And basically, P.S. got him to do my first, because I did my first novella with P.S. Uh, Publishing. Uh, do you happen to have a check copy of um, no, Osama? No, I didn't bring it. Come on, I ask you. It's so heavy. 
It's um, wonderful. And also, I don't know who designed it. No, but um, with Pedro, it's PS basically found him with my first novella, and then he kind of became my default artist. And he's he's brilliant. I like I read an interview with him when he talks about what he does, and it's all references to 1950s and 60s European designers. I don't know anything of what he does. So I never know what he's going to come up with, and he does all my PS Publishing Limited editions. And I, you know, with the summer, I mean, I thought we were expecting a sort of detective -y noir cover, and he came up with this hyper modernist penguin cover. You know, the shadow, the silhouette, and the thing. It was amazing. We were like, okay. Well, I mentioned yeah. the, the, the Czech edition because uh, it's particularly beautiful. It's it's one the of the best Czechs covers do. I've ever seen. And the first thing, you know, I asked Lavi, what's the name of the artist? I want to know the name of the artist. Yeah, he doesn't. I, I still don't know. But the Czechs, they did, uh, they, they do like really interesting covers. But um, again, I don't really have any say in it. But with Sarah in particular, I designed, you know, well, well, I say I designed. That might be a bit of a, you know, glamorize my role a bit more than it is but I did the art direction you know so and we so we basically we got introduced by a mutual friend and he turned out that we kind of think in the same way that we both like retro futuristic pop covers which actually um, you know um, I, I discovered at some point because I happen to have a collection of old Soviet post stamps set right. space post stamps it's exactly like one of them so I believe that it, it was heavily influenced by one of those you know uh, so, uh, Soviet Soviet um, uh, well, I mean, space exploration era uh, post stamps yeah this is so this is the original poster this is in the cover for the book so the if you can see the kind of the frame on it, the, these are orange groves from a 1930s Visit Palestine uh, poster. So I kind of located the poster and kind of we ended up using that. And then I don't know how she came up with that weird mushroom space station. I don't have to do with that. And the rockets are actual kind of designs for spaceships. So that's the one thing we get the most comments on. They're, they're called pylons. Pylons. <laughs> Every time this gets tweeted or something, someone will tweet you back and go, Oh, pylons! Well done for using pylons! Like, apparently there's like a whole fan club for pylons and how they're going to change the future, but I don't know what they are. <laughs> but they're like, well done! I mean, that's really cool, you use pylons in the... So that's all that. But I, I basically just say, we, what we need is something that looks like this, and maybe we have the influence of this artist, can you do something? And then she comes with that, and I, I, I take full credit, basically. <laughs> I did that. Yeah. Okay, I started with postmodernism. Postmodernism. I would like to finish with postmodernism. I would like to uh, quote one line from uh, from Central Station, and it goes like this: "The spaceport, this great white whale, like a living mountain rising out of uh, of the urban bedrock." Uh, when I was reading it the first time, you know, I almost automatically associated it not with Moby Dick, you know, not with the white white whale, but with the dragon gruel from uh, the stories by Lucius Shepard. Does anyone know them? And it's a very uh, the dragon gruel. It's called the dragon gruel. Gruel, gruel, gruel. Yeah, Shepard, Shepard told me the right pronunciation is gruel. Oh, is he? Yeah, Sorry. but you know, well, you, you never know. He doesn't there know. You, you know. Go. So uh, you, you never know. Uh, when it comes to you know pronunciation of you know those exotic names, um, uh, and, and and basically uh, this is a collection of, of novellas, not not short stories about a huge dragon, semi dead. Uh, his mind works, but his body is dead, and there's life going on around. There are small villages on you know on uh, on slopes of of, of, of this carcass, and uh, there are things going on there. So uh, th there's a some, some like a postmodern link, you know, between those. I, I know he, he hasn't been influenced by, by Shepard's writing to to no. a large extent, but there's a fascinating similarity. Lavi uses the uh, the reference to the white whale, of, of the obvious association with Moby Dick. My first association was uh, Dragon Gruel, you know, from the Shepard's Shepard's. Really, if you haven't read them, you know, I strongly recommend because they are absolutely marvelous uh, pieces of writing. I've completely lost you now. Um, uh, uh, question time. <laughs> If you have any questions to Lavi, ask please. Him about yeah, ask him about Mr. Shepard. Any questions? Ask about him about Shepard, anything. Yeah. I did meet him once. So. But yeah. Please, something, anything. Probably something else than Central Station, because I, I really wanted to concentrate on Central Station tonight. Yeah, I was going to talk about my, the, the, that true space opera thing and how yeah, go it ahead. was misunderstood. Go ahead, yeah. No, it's. <laughs> okay. 
I could ask you to talk about your space opera. Yeah. What? I could ask you to talk about your space opera. Please do talk no, about your space opera. No, I'm just opera. really annoyed about this thing. I had a story. I saw this story to Tor.com. It was published a few months like this year. And it's called The Old Dispensation. It's like a T.S. Eliot reference. But basically, I, for years, I had this idea of, you know, do you, did anyone ever watch History of the World Part 1? No? Mel Brooks? Right. And at the end, he advertised History of the World Part 2 and there's the whole Jews in space. You know, he goes, Jews in space! And I always thought, you know, someone should write that Jews in space thing. And I always thought, you know, there should be a space, like a Jewish space opera. Um, because they're always so, like, Western, they're so Anglo, there's their, you know, the heroes are... And I thought, that would be really cool. So I, wrote, I finally ended up writing it after years of kind of thinking about it. And obviously the whole thing is a massive piss take. Um, of space opera from the very first line onwards and um, and I, like I said I saw the tour and tour published it and I've never had a story that got the responses that this story got in fact no one thought it was funny in the slightest but it's got this long common thread that discusses post-Zionist um, politics and someone called me a um, a Catholic, it, it said that it was Catholic apologia. I don't know what that means. Um, it was really painful. I was like, seriously, no one think it was funny. There's like so many jokes. And the, the only way to make it work was obviously to play completely straight. So on the surface, it's a completely straight space opera. Um, you know, that has Dune in it and it has the, the search for Saint Aquinas in it. Do you remember that? Yeah, Anthony Boucher is like a radio author. You know, he's got all of this stuff, but literally every single line is a piss take on space. No one got it, and it's like it's been so painful for me. <laughs> and and like I think John pointed out that the, the, the Venn diagram of people who think this is funny and people who like get the reference, and then there's like three people in the middle. <laughs> so I blame myself. But I still got paid. So you know. But yeah. Any questions, please? Mind. Anyone? Go ahead. Can I ask you about uh, Tel Aviv? I, I thought, I mean, I don't know how many people even know uh, the Tel Aviv station, but I thought it would be really nice to see it at the center of the science fiction. Yeah, right, because you don't. Know, it's like, it's not a really a done thing, is it? Um, and also, whenever people do it, they do it badly because they don't really know the place. I mean, you know, there's nothing worse than seeing Israelis in science fiction, you know. It's always, it's a bit like Israelis in Hollywood films. You're either a Mossad agent, and they don't... So this is a very, it's kind of like a very Israeli science fiction novel, but Israelis don't really consider me an Israeli science fiction writer. And then everyone else didn't quite get it. But it's, it's mostly, it's about... Um, it's kind of an, against the Western idea of science fiction where it's always about the lone hero. And that's, I think well, that's one of the biggest differences between kind of the West and other places. Is that it's always about the, the individual. And Central Station is all about, well, it's not about the individual. It's the, no, it's it doesn't matter who you are. It's, you have to deal with the fact that your second cousin's ex-wife's husband from the second marriage, who's related to, you know, the, that's the guy you have to deal with. You know, and there's that whole system of obligation of third cousins, you know, twice removed, who's not really cousins, but were adopted or someone died and became honorary members of the family. And, and you know, and that's, you never get this in science fiction, because it just doesn't, ex it didn't, didn't exist to the Americans are writing it, or to the Brits. Um, but he's such an important bit, and I think you know people like Aliette de Bedard have kind of been looking at stuff like this. Um, but obviously, if you're writing an Israeli science fiction, it's impossible to kind of just say, "Oh, he just set off to the stars," you know? Yeah, he did. But then his mum called him and said, "Listen, you have to go back because your second cousin needs a favor." So that's what the book is about. Um, but Tel Aviv is very much about, especially Central Station. Um, I started writing it when I was living in Jaffa, so I actually started it there, and then I kind of came back here. And but is the opening scene somehow real, you know, like, did you go to Tel Aviv and set over a pint of beer and started writing something? Well, I didn't, because I didn't think it was safe, but um, <laughs> no, I, I did go, 
Well, my landlord, funnily enough, at the time took me on a tour because they owned this building in the old neighborhood. And, uh, he t you know, lovely, lovely guy called Yossi. Um, and he took me for this old tour, showed me everything around. And one of the things that really stuck in my mind, he took me to this bookshop. And you can see that no one has visited this bookshop in like 20 years. And it's this old guy selling textbooks of my uncle. My dad's uncle was like a geographer back in the 30s or something. He wrote these textbooks on geography. Why papyrus? You know, like if you, if you went to school in Israel 40 years ago, you would have read them. That's what he was selling. Essentially. Well, did you buy anything from that? No. I didn't buy it. And he goes, oh, yeah, you know, and there was like, like a double murder across the road from me yesterday, you know. And, uh, and in this little shop, he had hanging from a, like, literally from like a string in the shop, he had this plan for Central Station. You know, the, the original plan. Bus station. For the, for a, and it's this amazing utopian building. You know, it's this... It's, it's really amazing, it's remarkable. And you, and, and you see him showing it to you, he's like, look, this is what could have been, you know. And I left and I thought, oh, you have to write this. I mean, you couldn't make this up. Um, but you do want to keep the kind of double murder and the prostitutes around the corner. <laughs> um, but it's always that what could have been, you know. Um, but it's an amazing place. And like I said, there's no one writes about these places. And when I went to Israel, like, you know, I. Uh, I think that one of the last conventions I went to Israel, and there was this guy doing a comic, and you know, this is this what happens where whichever country you go to, and you go, oh, that looks cool. He goes, yeah. He goes, it's vampires, but it's in Tel Aviv. <laughs> it's like, yeah, well done. No, no, you keep. It's zombies, but it's in Krakow. You know, and it's like, <laughs> it's, it's the same thing. You know, it's Buffy, but it's in Ekaterinburg. You know, and it's. They're kind of trying to transpose these American, these Western sort of ideas into where they are. Models and... And, and it doesn't really yeah. work. It doesn't really work. So. John? I, I actually have a question. I could ask you this privately, but um, just building on what you were talking about, you were just complaining, actually, publicly. That, uh, <laughs> As usual. People didn't get the jokes, so in, don't your, get the jokes. in your Juicy Space story. Right. Okay. So do you think um, the readership wherever they are, doesn't get other aspects of your work. Um, oh, yeah. And it's a question that kind of leads on to where, where do you see your ideal reader? Who is a Mami T. Excellent. Your work is very eclectic. You're writing and, you know, I've, I've read a lot of your stuff that other people won't have read because it's not yet published. But, yeah. you know, and I can see you, you don't follow a formula, yet there are formulae conventions in your work, mm. um, you don't, you know, we could identify a Joe Abercrombie reader, mm. uh, Brandon Sanders reader, uh, William Gibson reader, perhaps, but who, who reads your stuff? Who do you want to be reading your stuff? Well, I never thought anyone read this stuff, and then I occasionally run into them and they're weird. <laughs> so, <laughs> you know, they are, they're odd people, I don't know what makes them tick. Are you um, saying we're all weird? Well, I do get, I do get a few to be special cases. No. Um, no. So now you've written, even though you haven't spoke about it tonight, you've written a children's book. I mean, I'm not, am I allowed to talk about it? You can talk about it. I can't talk about it. But who's the reader? Well, that, I expect, would be, you know, an international bestseller. Well, to use a, you know, academic term, who's your ideal implied reader? Well, I mean, people are just not bright enough to... No, um, I don't know. I mean, what surprised me, you never know who the hell is going to read this. I mean, Central Station, I honestly thought, you know, 200 people are going to buy this book, maybe. And, that was, and I was quite relieved. Like, I'm, it was my vanity project. It was like, I'm just going to put it out there. No one has to know about it, you know, while I'm working on this thing. <laughs> And people liked it. It's like, I don't understand. Why so, did they like was the it? Campbell Award for Central Station and uh, Clark nomination as a surprise to you? Yes, I don't understand it. <laughs> I honestly, I don't understand why anyone... And, you know, it sold something like 10 foreign rights. Like, it's coming out in China and Russia. And no. so, why? I don't understand any of it. So, you know, Where's a Man Likes Dreaming? It's a book I absolutely love. And then people kind of go, yeah, I don't think like... And I mean, maybe people don't like reading books about Adolf Hitler as a private detective. I don't know. 
Um, maybe I'm just. Yeah, what's I'm your like, no thing with Adolf Hitler, actually? I don't know. It's an entertaining. What's, what's your thing with private detectives? <laughs> yeah. Well, they're just. They're, it's a lot of fun to write that sort of hard boiled noir thing. The similes, you know, it's the similes I really like. <laughs> it's. Uh, but I think the interesting reviews for a man like Jeremy were the ones that said, I can see where he's going with this, but actually I kind of think... Well, actually, the, know, the Guardian review the Guardian review of a man like Jeremy was very enthusiastic. Yeah, but I mean, the, the, the Jewish reviews were kind of... Because the whole book is about how do you write the Holocaust, right? And it says, you know, there's the, the Primo Levi version, which is very scientific and quiet and accurate. And then there's the, the Katsetnik version, which is the pulp, shouty version. And, you know, the book kind of makes the argument that maybe the pop version is okay. And then the reviews kind of point out, mm, yeah, no. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I can't really argue with that one. Because Primo Levi is clearly the better writer than Contending. But, but it was fun when, you know, when they, when they do pick on the argument, even if they don't agree with your conclusion. Well, one of the most interesting aspects of A Man Lies Dreaming, actually, is that, you know, it sort of draws inspiration from uh, Jewish pornography, because it was the first writing... Well, I mean, who doesn't? The... Who, doesn't draw... <laughs> who doesn't draw inspiration from Jewish pornography? Uh, could, could you say um, a few words? Because it was really surprising when Lavi told me that um, uh, in Israel, uh, back in the 1960s, right, right, the first writing about the Holocaust was pornography. Well, I mean, this is kind of where the whole book comes from, is this idea that, basically... The Holocaust wasn't a subject to be discussed, you know, so people did not discuss it. It was, it was not to be talked about. And it was only during the 60s and the Eichmann trial um, that the subject first came up. And that's also when this kind of, you know, very soft call by modern standards, pornography came out. That was kind of all this very men's only, like the American, you know, men's adventure or whatever. And... Uh, you know, setting kind of concentrate POW camps and having iron nymphomaniacs torturing these POWs or whatever. But this was the introduction of my dad's generation to sex, basically. It was, hey, you know how most of your family died in the Holocaust? Well, here's a book you can have for a couple of sterling, and it's all about being tortured by these you know, really sexy Nazis. And it's a bizarre, it's an absolutely the weirdest thing. I've, I've ever heard of so you know that was really fascinating to me how does that become the only way you can talk about this horrible thing is by fetishizing it you know um, so that was really interesting so that's kind of partly what the book is is engaged with uh, uh, it's, it's, it's fetish it's fetishization is that a kind of big thing for you personally and creatively because uh, I, I picked up the comments yeah no, no, really. I, mean, I, I really love the psalm, and I, I thought, and I picked up what you said about the, 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 the bookshop, and in the psalm there's that lovely scene with the old guy and the tie. Yeah, he's got lovely Could have been better and written. Kind of stuff. And it's and it's a really lovely relationship. Right. It, it keeps him happy. Yeah, and it's like, and I, I just, and other things like you say, the fetishism and porn and everything is, um, and Edward Howard as well, and all these kind of things that are very, 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 very. Scientology is very fetishy. It's about the suitcase. With a piece of paper in it and the thing, and the mm. thing you're always you're always yearning for something you could never get, and is and how because I've kind of I this has been such a this has been such a great kind of listening to you talking to you really inspiring, especially now kind of oh yeah you know you have to do all this stuff and follow these well, formulae and all these kinds of things. And it, it's and I, daily love is morning, you know. If you um, are following on Twitter, he does it on on daily basis. Yeah, like yeah. moaning about <laughs> everything, you know. Well, yeah, no. he's really good at it. He's really good at it. Okay. Oh <laughs> yeah, no, no. no I mean the 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 Katoy thing in Osama was purely because you know when you live in Laos, yeah. that's kind of part of life. That you have. It, it, it's really just it was really that about other things and fetish like different. Are these kind of through lines in your? Well, it wasn't fetishized in Osama. Is what I'm saying. It was mm. just part of. It was People really get... only. It was only a man lies dreaming where. Mm. Which takes, a, but that's that is a part of what happened with the Nazis. Mm. That they became fetishized. You know, mm. the, the the uniforms, the Yugo Boss thing. You know, the the leather. 
But they um, themselves were very fetish they were very into the occult. Yeah, they were very. They were, well, actually, so my. Because I loved writing that particular Hitler so much, I keep mm. writing short stories. Um, set in that universe, even though they don't really serve any useful purpose. But, um, so the next one is coming out in Apex magazine in October, so in a few days. Um, and that kind of goes into that occult obsession where they were like, you know, the, 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 the spear of destiny and, mm-hmm. you know, oh, nudism, that's a good, veg- vegetarianism, yeah. you know, let's kill everyone. You know, they were like, you know, summoning demons. Yeah, all these things are really cool Architecture ideas. Architecture as well, because yeah. yeah. Absolutely. And there were this whole idea of yeah, rebuilding Berlin, amazing, yeah. yeah. What is that? But I mean, that's what's so interesting about the 20th century, is yeah. that there was so much weird stuff. I mean, if you look at, you know, Elwin Hubbard in the 50s when he visited London, and he's giving these lectures, you know, and everyone's in suits and ties, because that was obviously the way, and he's talk, you know, he's talking absolute bollocks. <laughs> but there's this whole auditorium full of people, because the 50s, they were like... Is ESP possible? Can we communicate with cabbages? Yeah. You know, <laughs> they were into all the, you know, the, the mysterious life of plants. That was a book I kind of grew up in in the eighties. Yeah. Right? Come true. Um, yeah, but so c- 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 can I telepathically talk to a cabbage? You know, is free love real? You know, can I astral project? And so they were all into that, and it's very hard from where we are in mean, a more cynical age to kind of look at the fifties and they just came through the war and they're kind of like questing for meaning, you know, and everything is possible. It's amazing. Does postmodernism have some responsibility for trying to kind of make that happen now and it become kind of dangerous, do you think? No, I mean, I like post- postmodernism. is more of a literary thing. It's kind of highlighting... More a strategy text. than a movement, actually. Yeah, it's a t- highlighting a text in a text, and when it's good, it's really good, but I think the problem we have is that we either have genre trying really hard to just be so kind of realistic feeling that you forget it's a story yeah. about aliens, you know, whatever. But at the same time, you know, the, the, the writing that we seem to hold up is basically stuff people write in New York. And I'm like, I've never been to New York, so yeah. I don't really care that much. Yeah. That's, you know, about sort of literary, important literary fiction that came from New York doesn't interest me that much but then my you know my background where I've been is so different to that and I'm like there's, there's only so much I can see I mean someone asked me recently if I could write um, you know it's Halloween coming up he's like can you write something for my site about Halloween like do a list like I don't know what Halloween is like I, I watched it on American TV that's what I know but it's, you've got the wrong culture like I don't, I don't know what it is I've got nothing to do with it you know, ask me for a Hanukkah list. Um, <laughs> yeah. uh, the last question, please. Lavi, have you any unfinished work which you have to leave to one side to take care of more pressing projects? Anything that, that you can tell us about? Yeah, no, I've got about five, seven, twelve. Um, unfinished manuscripts. I'm I'm really bad at finishing things. Um, I've got a book about um, H.P. Lovecraft. I'm um, trying to write. It's been a few years going. Um, again, really fascinating character. I'm basically really attracted to these horrible people. Characters. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, H.P. Lovecraft is really interesting. So, you know, I'm hoping I can finish that book. It's not. Have you read the book by Michelle Wolbeck? Yeah, years ago. Though. It's a classic. Um, yeah, so you know, I've got about five finished, unfinished books, and what I'm thinking is next year, maybe instead of trying to write a new one, I should just try and finish one of these books. Um, plus, you know, I've got my, you know, mentioned my Osama the Musical. <laughs> I keep hoping, I come close every now and then, but maybe next year with Sci Fi London, we'll be able to do it. But, um, yeah. You know, and things always fall fall through, and then they end up somewhere else. And, yeah. Thank you very much all for joining us tonight, and thank yes, you very much all uh, Periscope Sorry users for, for watching us. Yes, and thank uh, you. Uh, la vida. Thank you. Hey.